Hi, let me begin by thanking my friends at Garfunkel Wild for putting on this virtual meeting and giving me an opportunity to talk for a few minutes about what's happening with ASCs at the national level. Obviously, this has been an extraordinarily difficult year for everyone. The COVID-19 pandemic and its influence on healthcare, as well as on uh, the larger economy, has been extraordinarily hard. And it's been a difficult year for ASCs, uh, but now, as we approach the end of the year, I'm looking back on it and realizing that I think the ASC community he, um, has done an amazing job and that I think we're really poised to have a, a good 2021 and future. If you look back at the beginning of the pandemic when we knew so much less about COVID-19 and about its spread, I think that you can look at those decisions early on to postpone so much care, particularly elective surgery when it comes to surgery centers, and, and recognize that that was you know, a you know, reasonable choice made at the time. I think we now know, however, um, that we can safely provide care even in the midst of a pandemic because of the a number of steps that ASCs have always taken to reduce the spread of infection inside the OR, as well as the additional preventive steps that I think we've all become very familiar with um, thanks to the pandemic. And these include such things as routine screening and answering questionnaires, temperature taking, masking, social distancing. You, you layer all those on top of what was already a very safe way to provide healthcare. And I think we can safely provide care to almost anyone. Uh, in fact, the ASC Quality Collaboration, which is a sister organization to ASCA, uh, did a survey of surgery centers about care that was provided um, in March and April. Uh, when those guidance were in, in effect to postpone elective care. And they, they asked about urgent care that was still being provided. Now, mind you, this was care that was being provided early on in the pandemic when we were just uh, learning and starting to implement those additional safety measures that I outlined a minute ago. But even with that, with almost 85,000 patients seen in this survey, they found an, an infection rate, meaning a patient was identified to have COVID-19 somewhere within 14 days after receiving the care in the surgery center, that we had an infection rate of 0.19%, which is extraordinarily low, meaning that these surgery centers providing this urgent care, and again, without the benefit of fully having implemented all the things that we take for granted now, still kept patients extraordinarily safe. So since then, obviously, as those guidance expired and, and more and more surgery centers got back to doing work, um, you know, we're still trying to catch up on those backlogs. Uh, but I believe that we're seeing patients and, and seeing them without any risk of spreading COVID-19 to either the patients um, or to the staff um, working in the surgery centers. Uh, in, indeed, I'm hoping that ASCA will be sending out a survey uh, sometime next week, um, at middle of November. Uh, that will be um, asking questions about the impact of COVID-19 financially on surgery centers, operationally on surgery centers, and then asking some of these key, key questions about how they've kept patients safe and, and the number of infections they've seen um, so that we can collect that data and then use it um, to help guide our advocacy uh, through the rest of this year and into 2021. But if you look back on uh, the, the challenges that we faced um, and continue to face, um, I, I think that you know, we're showing that we're doing a really good job. And while there's many lessons to be learned, um, I think it's identified some key things, you know, both for the ASC community and the larger health community and uh, our government, whether at the federal or state level, the things that we need to do um, that have been exposed because of this pandemic uh, that can allow our healthcare system to work better uh, both today and down in the future. One of those things I think uh, about is this whole idea, I've, I've used the term a few times already, of elective surgery. And one of the things that I think uh, this pandemic has exposed to us is that there is a fundamental understand, misunderstanding of what we mean by elective care. 
Elective care does not mean unnecessary care. It merely means that it's care that is scheduled for some time in the future. Uh, and indeed, I think since the postponement of so much care, we're now learning that there's a reckoning for that, that there are many patients that are in a worse position in terms of their personal health for having delayed that care um, during those key early months of the pandemic. It's something that I think the medical specialty societies are drawing attention to. Um, and I think there's a, a, a greater understanding that um, postponing care has consequences and it's not something that should be done lightly. Now obviously if you're in the middle of a situation where there's limited access to key medical supplies, um, that could be necessary down the road. But so long as we don't face that challenge, and, and God willing, I think that you know, we're, we're ramping up in a way that will ensure that everyone has the supplies they need, I don't foresee a reason why we would need to delay or postpone surgeries again like happened in the spring. Now, in terms of the challenges going forward, um, they are plentiful. Um, I think particularly about one, I just mentioned the supply chain. I think we do need to make sure that uh, we have a, uh, enough uh, medical supplies uh, to withstand any future sp spikes in the pandemic. And unfortunately, we are seeing those spikes occur around the country um, even today. So I, I know that most surgery centers have access to the PPE they need. Um, the question is, what are they paying for? It? You know, I, I think we need to make sure that we have a, a, enough supply that prices aren't being artificially raised to a point um, that's going to impact uh, the, the cost of health care. Something that I think we need our Congress and the administration to really focus on, uh, both in the next COVID relief package that will hopefully be enacted sometime later this year and into 2021. The other big issue, obviously, early on in the pandemic was the, um, because of the economic consequences of so much care being delayed, that many surgery centers, physicians' offices, other healthcare settings were really in dire financial straits. And uh, we were very appreciative that the, the Trump administration and Congress enacted some financial relief, came up with some ways to, to put a little bit of liquidity back into um, these healthcare settings allowed them to, to hopefully keep their employees um, and staff uh, employed um, and, and be positioned to get back to work once those guides to delay surgery um, were relieved. And that's essentially happened. Um, you know, I'm very pleased to see that uh, most surgery centers that I talk to are about back at 90% capacity of what they were year over year. Uh, and I think we have to realize that the fact that they're not at 100% is probably for a couple of good reasons. One, of course, is the fact that the, the, the new protocols that are in place um, to protect patients and to ensure um, that the ORs and other areas are infection free take a little bit of extra time. So I think that uh, the time per surgery has probably gone up a little bit. Uh, and while a little bit in one surgery doesn't matter over the course of a day, over the course of a week, over the course of a month, I think you're seeing a little bit of an impact there that is uh, you know, causing that um, little bit of drag compared to the, the volume that surgery centers have seen in the past. The other issue that I would identify is that we still obviously have many patients that are leery of going into a healthcare facility and getting care uh, while we're still in the midst of this pandemic. I think that you know, we're starting to do a better job of trying to explain and show to patients how um, the surgery center is a safe site of service. Uh, but I think there's still some patients out there that are still taking a wait and see approach. Uh, and it's going to take a little more time before we get them back into the OR to get the care that they need. From a health policy perspective, I think one of the things that uh, I, I hope comes out of this is a recognition that having alternate sites of service like a surgery center that are not on a hospital campus is actually a good thing. And that uh, being able to segregate you know, healthy non-COVID patients from those that are suffering from COVID and need the, the uh, amazing help that the hospitals are giving them, keeping those two patient populations separate makes a lot of sense. And I think that hopefully there'll be some um, understanding that having ASCs and having um, all these sites of service off the campus of a, of a large hospital or health system 
is a wise one and, and something that will hopefully create some momentum for the surgery center model uh, independent of the many other advantages that we've been able to point out in the past in terms of efficiency, you know, lower cost, high quality. So I'm really hoping that, that you know, the, one of the uh, benefits um, of, of, you know, having to go through this is that we'll see the need to have, you know, a healthcare system um, that is kind of widespread and has many points of access so that we can keep safe patients away from those that are, that are ill. Um, the other big thing that I'm hoping will be a, a source of, um, you know, of, be inside this next COVID relief package is a recognition that we currently have millions of Americans that have lost their jobs and therefore are losing access to the health coverage that they may have had. Um, we, we can't afford to have these Americans not be able to get the care that they need. So I'm hoping whether it's, you know, building on their prior health insurance um, you know, additional COBRA coverage that, that Congress and the administration will really focus on making sure that people can get the care they need regardless of the impact of the economy on them right now. Uh, looking forward into, you know, 2021, again, I think that we're going to have a really good year. I think that, you know, um, the ASC model has really proven itself and proven its value. Uh, one looks back on the, the way the federal government has you know, treated ASCs in the past, and it's been you know, kind of a mixed bag. Uh, but I think I'm very appreciative if you think to early on in the pandemic when the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the agency that runs the Medicare program, actually created a hospital without walls program that would allow, have allowed ASCs and still allows ASCs to basically become licensed as hospitals and take care of patients they normally wouldn't under a normal regulatory framework. If you think about that, that's a, an amazing endorsement for the quality of care that ASCs have provided in the past. I think a recognition that, you know, that um, surgery centers as facilities are all but identical to, to that of a hospital outpatient department, that we have the, the same staff, the same nurses, the same physicians as that you'd see in a hospital outpatient department. Um, and that we are prepared, you know, to be able to see more patients and perform more procedures um, than, than we previously had been allowed to under um, CMS rules. Um, we have a proposed payment rule coming out um, in the next few weeks, and I'll speak to that in a few minutes, but I think you're going to see even an embedded in that rule, um, that understanding that um, ASCs can do far more than we've been allowed to do previously. Um, and that there's a lot of benefits to using ASCs, you know, beyond the, the current scope that, that we've been allowed to. Um, so I, I think that, you know, we have a, a really good, you know, um, basis for providing the care we provided. And I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be good times ahead, I hopefully, for surgery centers. Um, in terms of the regulatory front, as I mentioned, we have a... Uh, you know, proposed payment rule uh, due out in the next few weeks. Uh, the proposed rule came out, you know, later this, this past summer. Um, embedded in it, I think, is a growing awareness that surgery centers can be better used um, to provide access to care for Medicare beneficiaries. Um, we are fortunate that we have a, you know, 2.6% inflationary increase um, proposed in that rule. No. I got to mention that because it was in the proposed rule doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be in the final rule, that there is often the opportunity for CMS to kind of change its mind or change its perspective on things as they um, go from proposed rule to final rule. However, that said, I think if you think of the environment in, under which we've been working and the extent to which CMS has had to be preoccupied, obviously, with COVID-19, I don't think we expect a lot of significant changes in our rule from proposed to final. Um, so that 2.6% inflationary increase, I think, is, uh, is um, uh, a good one. And I, I think it also speaks to the importance of ASCA's advocacy, because uh, a few years back, we were being updated for inflation using a broad inflationary increase um, uh, factor known as the Consumer Price Index for Urban Consumers. The issue there is, is that was an inflationary index that did not look at the cost of goods and services in the healthcare setting, but instead looked at the overall economy. 
And when you think about the economy this year, and obviously all the devastation uh, in you know large and small in our economy because of the uh, pandemic, we likely could have had a much lower inflationary uh, update had they used that old CPIU versus this new hospital market basket. So I'm, I'm very appreciative that CMS is continuing to use that inflation factor. It's something we've been asking for for over a decade now. It's something that we're still looking to get embedded statutorily uh, in some legislation we have before Congress. The other big takeaway from our proposed rule um, has to do with procedures. You know, as I've mentioned, I think there's a growing awareness at CMS of the, the value of using surgery centers uh, and that we are set up to provide care to more patients on more different procedures than we're currently allowed to. And there's a couple of different proposals in this rule um, to allow that and to actually, you know, one of which would be to move a great bolus of procedures off of the hospital um, outpatient list and allow ASCs to start performing them in uh, 2021. A, a second approach, and I think it's odd, CMS kind of gave two alternatives, one of which they've, they'll adopt according to what they're saying, uh, would be to create a new fairer process for uh, medical specialty societies to propose moving procedures off of the hospital patient list to allow them to be performed in surgery centers. One of the things that we have been arguing with uh, CMS about for a long time is the kind of the black box behind which decisions are made about which procedures move off of the inpatient list to the hospital outpatient list to the surgery center list. And so um, they're talking about creating a, a much more transparent process for that, as well as finally disclosing the, the, the data that they'll use to make decisions so that we have a better opportunity to rebut those decisions if we disagree. So I think we're really looking forward to kind of a new day in terms of a quicker move to expand the number of procedures that ASCs can perform on Medicare beneficiaries. Even with that though, there's always a little bit of bad news. And the bad news is, is that you know, we still need obviously uh, the payment um, of, of surgeries in, in our space to be addressed. Uh, we are reimbursed too low for many of the procedures that we perform on Medicare beneficiaries. Um, roughly, on average, we get paid about 50 cents on the dollar for what the hospital outpatient department gets reimbursed. Um, that's just not sustainable. I think that if policymakers want to try to find ways to make the Medicare program uh, more efficient, they have to find ways to um, entice patients uh, to, to move their care. Um, their, to get their care in the surgery center. Uh, we need to re be reimbursed a bit. We have to be incentivized to want to take that volume and move it. Currently, that doesn't exist. And there's some things that we've been working on on both the regulatory level and the congressional level to try and address that. Uh, but that's a big challenge. I think until we address that reimbursement, I think we're not going to see the migration of care uh, in terms of Medicare cases um, that, that I think we all want. That, uh, and that I think that would really help to improve the Medicare program and, and quite frankly, help us as taxpayers. Um, so I'm hoping the next administration will, will really uh, look hard at that uh, and will be willing to work with us to find a way to make the Medicare program more efficient. Uh, and I think that's going to involve you know, providing some additional uh, reimbursement to surgery centers to try and migrate more of that care to our space. Um, as I said, I think that payment rule will be uh, coming out uh, probably before Thanksgiving. It's a little bit delayed and that's no surprise obviously because of all the work that's been done, you know, with us still being in a public health emergency. Uh, but I, but I'm, I feel pretty bullish about that, that rule. And again, well, the devil in the details we'll see in a, in a couple of weeks. From the congressional side, other than things I've mentioned that we'd like to see in a COVID relief package, you know, we still have our ASE um, Quality and Access Act. Um, which is really focused on a, a number of you know, small provisions that I think would make uh, the Medicare program work better for us, work better for the system, um, and, and I think allow ASCs to, to, to do better uh, in terms of, uh, of participating in Medicare um, and, and allowing the Medicare program to serve beneficiaries in, in new and better ways. You know, at, at the end of the day, you know, the, the basis of the ASC model is our efficiency. 
the fact that you know we're as high quality as any other setting is obviously um, amazing and something that I think we should you know continue to, to trumpet. Um, but the fact that we can provide care at, at so much less cost, both on the commercial side uh, as well as in these federal programs, is something that we need greater recognition of and that I think that we need uh, greater support for. Uh, so in the couple of minutes le I have left in this little, little presentation, I just want to remind everyone that you are all advocates for a smarter, better healthcare system too. And that what we need is, is we need people to talk with their lawmakers, you know, uh, whether at the members of Congress, your senators, or at the state level, uh, your lawmakers in your state house, and make them understand that we are an example of a way that you can have a smarter, better healthcare system without reducing access to quality uh, and with, I think, providing a, a number of great benefits. So uh, don't miss an opportunity if you happen to meet with a lawmaker or a policymaker to talk about the ASC model and the things that we've been doing uh, to try and create greater efficiency, to show that you can be less expensive while providing the same high quality in a customer-friendly experience. Um, we've obviously had a little bit of a pause at the federal level in the past couple of years in terms of um, quality reporting, and it's one of the things that I think I've taken great pride in is since the development of our ASC quality reporting program, we've been able to show and demonstrate amazing results on the measures that have been applied to ASCs. Uh, so, you know, the past couple of years we have not seen a, a lot of interest in expanding that program. It's a mixed blessing. I think that uh, we, no one likes to have additional regulation, um, but I think it has provided a great opportunity for surgery centers to show our work and show the great quality care we're being provided. What I'm hopeful is, is that as we move down the road into the next administration, where I suspect there will be a, a greater focus again on this issue of quality reporting, that we can find ways to have more measures, and particularly more measures that we can look at cross settings at, so that we can compare the quality of care, not just within ASCs, you know, one ASC to another, or one ASC versus you know, the, the whole ASC community, but can compare ASCs to you know, hospitals, um, so that patients have better guidance about where to go get the, their care. That combined with the fact that we're already able to demonstrate to patients that they can get less expensive care, lower copays, lower deductibles if they go to the surgery center, I think will create a really compelling environment um, for, for ASCs and I think allow us to, to, to really prosper uh, while continuing to provide great care to the patients that we serve. I think I'm about out of time. Uh, again, I appreciate this opportunity by my friends at Garfunkel Wild to, to speak to you for a few minutes. The ASCA website has loads of information on many of the things that I've been talking about. I would certainly recommend that any of you go there if you have questions. You're also welcome to reach out to me. If, you have the, if you're an ASCA member or it could be an ASCA member, please, please renew your membership or join. Um, we have been working really hard to try and protect the AAC model and to promote it through the most difficult times of this year. Uh, we're going to continue to do that you know, into the future, but the more resources we have, and by resources I mean members paying their dues, members listening to our messages and helping to convey them through grassroots, the greater the chance for us uh, to accomplish all the things that I've been talking about. So with that, um, again. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy the rest of this virtual meeting, uh, and I look forward to working with you to create a better healthcare system today and into the future. Good morning. My name is Greg Bloom, and I'm a partner director of Garfunkel Wild and the chairperson of Garfunkel Wild's corporate department. I want to thank you all for joining us today for this new virtual version of our annual symposium. This is going to be our local tri state portion of our annual State of the Union segment, and we're happy to have the leaders of each of our three tri-state ambulatory surgery center associations who will give us their perspectives on the current state of the industry and hot topics from their respective states, followed by some questions for our leaders. I'm gonna keep my introductions brief today as most of you are familiar with our leaders from past years. First up, we are gonna have John Van Valkenburg, president of the New York State Association of Ambulatory Surgery Centers. The New York State Association represents over 130 mm -hmm. ambulatory surgery centers 
and provides educational programs promoting safety and efficiency in ambulatory surgery and advocates for legislation which impacts care in New York. After John, we welcome back Jeff Shanton, president of the New Jersey Association of Ambulatory Surgery Centers. In addition to serving the association, Jeff is also actively involved in many other advocacy and legislative groups on behalf of New Jersey ASCs. Following Jeff, we have our annual cleanup hitter for the State of the Union panel, Lisa Winkler, who will provide us with the Connecticut update. Lisa has over 20 years of experience in many aspects of local, state, and federal government relations. She spearheaded the development of the Connecticut Association of Ambulatory Surgery Centers in 2005 and remains the association's executive director. Thank you very much for joining us again. And now I'm gonna turn it over to John Van Valkenburg for the New York Update. John. Thank you, uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, like Greg said, I'm, I'm John Van Valkenburg. I'm the president of the New York State Association of Ambulatory Surgery Centers. Um, just a quick update on our state. It's been a, uh, a busy year uh, for the state association as I'm sure it has been for the, uh, the, the other associations. Um, and, and obviously the, the big thing is, has been COVID. So I'm going I'm to talk a little bit about what the, the New York's response to that has been and, and, and kind of a timeline is how things unfolded and kind of where we're at today. Um, in New York State uh, on March 23rd, 2020, Executive Order 202.10 called for the cancellation and postponement of all elective procedures at all hospitals, ASCs, and office-based surgery centers in New York State. Um, that was something that we didn't really see coming. Obviously, this whole thing uh, really uh, developed and, and, and rolled out pretty quickly. Uh, in response to that, about half of the ASCs um, that we polled here in New York State chose to temporarily close and, and discontinue business. Uh, the other half remained open with limited staff to perform urgent and non-elective procedures. Uh, the, the state association immediately sprung into action to try and do everything we could do to, to help support not just our members, but all ASCs in New York State. We began holding daily update calls um, with, with our members and, and again others. We invited even non-member ASCs in the state uh, to disseminate information uh, to all of them and also to support them in, in any way possible to collect information, to spread information, to give people updates. And, uh, and, and really kind of act as a, uh, as a conduit or, or attempt to act as a conduit uh, between the surgery centers and the state. Um, then kind of our next, you know, as our heads were spinning, our next big scare came a little bit. You know, there was uh, a lot of ASCs were being contacted and there was a lot of media around uh, ventilator shortages and the use of uh, anesthesia machines um, as, as ventilators or to, to supplement the, the, the ventilators in, in New York State. So there was a lot of talk about, um, you know, basically the National Guard being deployed to pick up anesthesia machines from surgery centers throughout New York, mostly in upstate New York, and deliver them downstate where um, the concentration, um, the, the ventilator shortage issue was, was really significant. Um, that was something that, that I, I know you know, concerned, uh, you know, not just me and not just all of our members, but really uh, physicians and other providers throughout the state. Um, you know, we, uh, we, we had several calls and basically we reached out to the Department of Health and uh, Governor Cuomo's team. And, you know, we had several calls with them uh, regarding the anesthesia machines, um, you know, talking and, and trying to explain the limitations of them. And, you know, not, not just uh, that it probably wasn't a, a good solution to the problem, but that the, um, you know, that the implications for surgery centers would be, would be significant uh, in the long run, um, potentially, you know, of not getting machines back, not getting them back in, 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 in good condition and, and really uh, threatening the, the livelihood and the future of all ASCs if they were to have to go that route. Um, and, and we explained those issues to them and, and, and thankfully, you know, that wasn't a route they decided to go. But one thing we did want to do is, is try and um, really try and, and focus and guide the discussion with the Department of Health um, as to how ASCs can contribute to the crisis. Uh, you know, we were very, um, you know, anxious and eager, I guess, to do whatever we could, particularly with the fact that ASCs were, 
you know, closed down and we were kind of twiddling our twiddling our thumbs and trying to figure out what to do and how we could help. And, and obviously, particularly downstate, there was uh, a lot of significant, significant things going on. Um, so what we did is we started collecting information from our members and other ASCs in New York on the availability of, um, of some things we had, not the anesthesia machines, obviously, but some other things we had that we could, uh, you know, potentially commit or, uh, or make available to, to help address uh, some of the issues. And, and some of those things were PPE. Um, uh, one big thing was medications, including propofol, versed fentanyl, and morphine. Um, we, we had been, we had, had hospitals start reaching out to individual ASCs in their area, and they said, hey, you know, we're getting low on, so for example, those drugs um, that they needed to, to be able to intubate patients and to put them on ventilators, uh, they they were having critical supply shortages of those things. So we we as a state association, we really mobilized. Uh, we talked to all of our members and and we said, hey, look, you know, here's a way that maybe we can't help. And uh, you know, everybody kind of inventoried their supplies with regards to those types of things. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure if uh, you know that things were kind of being done in a coordinated way. So we kind of took the lead on that. We were communicating uh, regularly or multiple times a day with the Department of Health and with the governor's office on what we had available and, and, and what we might be able to commit um, to, to some of those solutions. And, uh, and you know, ultimately, uh, thankfully, we didn't need to go that route. And there was no, you know, no facilities, at least uh, as a group, um, sent any supplies or, or we didn't come to that. But uh, the state and the Department of Health uh, was very appreciative on you know, our, our willingness and also that we were able to organize to do that. So I, I think that that really helped a lot. And that was a, a one of the one of the positive things uh, that came from this and, and also the development uh, of of our relationship with with the state and the Department of Health. Um, then I, on October 29th, the governor uh, began to allow the resumption of elective procedures in select counties. Uh, but the issue with this is it was uh, applied to hospitals only. And this was a um, was something that we didn't see coming. You know, we were anticipating that there was going to be an, ex an updated executive order coming out to allow elective uh, procedures again. And and we were being told yeah, it's coming any day, any day. And then when it came, we were we were shocked that it uh, it only applied to hospitals and, and not ASCs. And again, you know, we 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 mobilized really quickly, and we were working, uh, you know, trying to communicate to the state. I mean. The, the way the way this whole thing has been handled in New York, um, it was really centralized as, as coming from the governor and his office, uh, not so much from the Department of Health. So it, it, it was tough because they um, they kind of, you know, in talking to them, they said, well, we're at the mercy of, of the information coming uh, from the governor's office. Uh, so that, that that made the communication a little bit difficult. But we, uh, you know, we, we pushed really hard on that. And we uh, formed a coalition of associations and societies of different provider groups throughout the state uh, to advocate for the resumption of elective cases, uh, for that resumption to include ambulatory surgery centers. And, and um, you know, we were, we were uh, successful in doing so. On May 19th, uh, that resumption of elective cases was expanded to include ASCs. Uh, so again, very welcome news. Um, you know, it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't all easy, though. Obviously, they they applied a lot of layers to that as well, including as I'm as I know they've done in, in, in other states, uh, the testing. So that was the next challenge. There was originally a three wind a three day window on the testing, and uh, we found that most of our members were having a lot of difficulty um, being able to reliably get the results within those three day windows. And although, uh, you know, ASCs were, were able to resume elective cases, uh, you know, entire days worth of cases were being uh, canceled uh, because of the lack of the, the results uh, getting back in time and really just the logistics of getting the patients tested. And, and it was a big challenge. Um, on June 14th, the number of days uh, prior to procedure that the patients had to be tested was increased from three to five. Uh, that that was great. Uh, really, that that five day window was able to get uh, just about all the all the surgery centers in, in New York State were able to really reliably get the results in in those time frames. So that was that was a very welcome development. Um, you know, there there has been a, a couple of of periods. You know, around the Fourth of July holiday, 
you know, we, we, we had a, an increase in, in surgery centers having difficulty getting those tests back. Um, and I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to interrupt too much, but we, we have a very limited amount of time. Oh, sorry. So, I'm so, so I need to get to my other, my other state. Sure. So get, <laughs> Absolutely. I should have, I should have put the clock up. Well, I apologize. I apologize. <laughs> no, I, that, I, I probably lost track of time yeah, already. Yeah, I thought yeah, I was at like two minutes. And we really, really appreciate that. But I, but being this is a, an odd format and virtual, yep. We're limited in time, so I'm going to move on to Jeff Shanton in New Jersey. And thank you very, very much. Okay. John. It was helpful. All right. Go ahead, Jeff. Hey, thanks, Greg. Um, good morning, everyone. I uh, want to thank Greg and Garfunkel Wild for inviting me again. I don't know, it's the fourth or fifth year on this panel. I believe it's a wonderful format, getting the leaders of the contiguous states together to discuss um, issues. Uh, NJSC is... I don't know by who by reckoning it changes all the time. We're the third or the fourth largest ASC state association uh, between uh, uh, 100 over 190 <laughs> surgical centers, 40 plus vendors, corporate members, associate members, and indeed uh, even during this crisis uh, we continued to grow, which to us was proof of the value of uh, state ASC association. Um, in March, when uh, the proverbial you-know-what hit the fan, we began to proactively collect information. It's always been my, uh, w one of my uh, importance that, you know, if you want to argue about something, you need to have information. We sent spreadsheets out to all the surgical centers in the state of New Jersey, asking them for specific information like ventilators, PPE, things like that. This was prior to the Department of Health, OEM, or anybody even asking for it. We sent that on to Department of Health who were suitably uh, impressed by it and indeed um, utilized our information in the opening salvos of the pandemic. The Department of Health then came to me and asked if we would be the point of contact and liaison between they and the our member ASCs in the state, I told them no, they were a little bit shocked. And I said, no, we will not do it for members. We will do it for every ASC in the state of New Jersey, which we did. And that was the birth of our COVID e-blast, which go out to probably about 800 email addresses. And at the height of the pandemic, we were probably sending them out three times a week or more chock full of uh, information about all the EDs, EOs, testing, you name it, anything like that. Uh, the surgical centers also would come back to us, ask us questions, which we would then forward back to the department. So the department obviously had did not have enough people to sit there and answer emails. They were obviously busy doing other things. So it worked out very, very well. We also maintained contact with the governor's office and the legislature. Uh, about this. Everybody probably knows uh, what uh, our governor did in borrowing money here from the, for the state and taxes and everything else like that. Well, we actively uh, were uh, talking to the governor's office and the legislatures, and we were very successful in that. We got no added taxes, no increase in anything that was out there, none of that. So that was really, um, you know, a good thing. Um, I also testified before a bipartisan committee, uh, along with hospital CEOs of uh, the state Senate, uh, about COVID and the effects on, uh, on us as ASCs, uh, you know, economic effects. And I also serve on the governor's uh, committee uh, to reopen uh, the economy. Well, we always had a great relationship with uh, the department. The crisis seemed to make it even closer than necessary. Um, when we when we first started getting into, I would say probably in April, we again went out and collected data on testing times, patient cancellations, all kinds of things, about eight different categories. Uh, again, we needed information to be able to go back to the department and say, hey, you got to fix what you gave us in your executive order and executive directives. And indeed, uh, this resulted in uh, the original four-day window being increased to six days. Um, the department also utilized our spreadsheets as part of uh, the official reporting portal. ASCs are required in the state of New Jersey to report via a portal once a week on certain questions, PPE, things like that. So we actually 
we, when, when the department gave it to us, we looked at it and said, nah, we redid it, gave it back to them. They used that for uh, reporting. We also got the department to change the executive directive on testing and quarantining. Um, originally, uh, we, with the six days, the patient had to quarantine, you know, during that time frame till the procedure. If the test did not come back within six days, uh, the poor patients were required under the ED to go out and get another test and quarantine again, which was, you know, absolutely ridiculous, created havoc for patients and obviously for surgical centers. Uh, we got them to change that to the fact that there's no retest required. If a test does not come back within six days, as long as the patient maintains quarantine, when the test comes in, the, the procedure can be performed. So that helped uh, completely with, um, uh, with, with that issue. We then decided that uh, as the governor started opening more things up and uh, people started going back to work, there was a patient safety issue. And that was, there's no way in God's name that people were going to not go to work, quarantine for six days when their kids could go out and play football and you could go to the mall and things like that. So we, uh, we said it's a, it, it's a safety issue and it revolved around the testing. We were only allowed to use PCR tests. Well, we got them to change the testing requirement to any uh, test for viral detection. So rapid antigen, you know, anything else like that was now, uh, is now allowed, and that has uh, helped considerably. Um, we uh, also uh, felt that by doing that, uh, we, we helped the laboratories because the laboratories were having a hard time with just PCR tests. Doctors didn't know what tests to give, everything else like that. So now we can essentially use anything here except for serology, which of course makes sense. Uh, moving forward, we are uh, kind of pivoting away from COVID a little bit, uh, but uh, we're, we're continuing with our, our slate of webinars, uh, virtual meetings and everything. In fact, we did several webinars on the various EOs and EDs when they came down to greatly assist uh, the surgical centers. And uh, we're also going to be uh, holding our uh, second annual infection control conference. So everything is going smoothly as it can possibly be under these trying times in New Jersey. So thank you, Greg. I appreciate the time. Great. And thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. And I'm going to go right over to Lisa to keep, keep us moving and as close to schedule as possible. All right. Perfect. Um, I'll try to be Quick, um, uh, just to give you a little bit of background, our, the, many of you have heard this before, but the Connecticut Association was formed in 2005. Uh, membership in the, in the association includes all 61 of the state's freestanding ambulatory surgery centers. A little nuance in Connecticut, um, the state required physician offices providing moderate to deep sedation um, within their offices to become licensed as outpatient surgical facilities. Several years ago. And so that was, that was really um, uh, created an, an increase in the, in the number of surgery centers that we had in Connecticut. Um, Connecticut also requires all hospital surgery centers and nursing homes to belong to a patient safety organization. CASC created our own um, and all of the surgery centers in Connecticut belong to that organization. So we host webinars on a now webinars used to be in-person meetings, but we host webinars on a regular basis on a variety of issues from infection control to sterile processing and everything in between. Um, we actually hosted a terrific webinar with Darfunkel Wild at one point as well. Um, we've really had a history of success and a strong unified voice in Connecticut. We have developed um, really good relationships with the Office of Healthcare Act, the Office of Health Strategy, um, the Department of Public Health, and the administration, which was proved really helpful during this whole pandemic. Um, I want to give a little snapshot, snapshot pre-COVID. Um, many of you remember we have a surgery center tax in Connecticut. And so before um, the pandemic hit in March, our session started in Feb February. It was a short session. So we were really working on providing additional tax relief for surgery centers 
um, the chair of the finance committee had um, proposed a new Medicaid deduction for us from the tax. You'll remember um, from my past conversations on the issue, we were successful in getting Medicaid and Medicare exempted from the tax, providing some um, additional relief for surgery centers. A public option bill was also working its way through the process. Um, and in, in the previous year, we were successful in first carving surgery centers out of that proposal. Um, which eventually died. Um, it was not directed specifically at surgery centers. Our concern was the extensive reporting requirements, utilization data, charges, prices, payments received, costs incurred, and revenues earned. Those were really the focus um, of some of the reporting requirements. And so it, it was a um, problematic provision for us. And we were in the process of working actually with the department um, on those provisions. So talks were underway in March really um, as the pandemic hit. Um, so like, we'll shift over to the, the COVID situation, like New York um, and New Jersey, uh, elective cases were halted in Connecticut, um, but we did not have an executive order that specifically dictated what the, the requirements um, would look like. There was a, a belief from the administration that um, only urgent um, and emergent cases would continue to be performed. And because of that lack of executive order, you had a lot of um, discussion within the healthcare industry about what was going on um, within surgery centers. And you had some um, directors of different surgical um, departments within the hospital community um, reaching out, expressing concern about the procedures that were still going on in surgery centers. And, and we really jumped into action at that point to try to manage those conversations. I, I was receiving calls on a daily basis about the kinds of procedures that were being done. So it was a very interesting time. I think we were um, epicenter adjacent in Fairfield County from New York. And so um, it was really a hot spot. There was a lot of concern about PPE and what was gonna happen throughout the state. So we, um, responded to those calls and really tried to share as much information like my colleagues with all of our members um, and then also with legislators to let legislators know what we were doing. Um, that we really wanted to be part of the response to the COVID pandemic. Um, because of our relationships with the state of Connecticut, a lot of the agencies, we were actually pulled into daily um, surge capacity planning calls with the state, um, with the administration, the Office of Health Strategy, the Department of Public Health, hospitals and others. Um, and so as, as we scaled back services, really um, much like our, our surrounding states, you saw some surgery centers close while others remained in operation to provide those urgent and emergent services. And so we really saw it as an opportunity to, to support our um, community providers and much like our colleagues provided, um, gathered information about what was available from a staff perspective, anesthesia machines, PPE. We put together a complete inventory of all of the ORs that were available, procedure rooms, anesthesia machines, um, ACLS certified staff, because at the state level, they were talking about, you know, delivering babies in field houses and setting up tent hospitals. And so we really wanted to be part of the solution. And we felt like that was really important to us. And I would say our president, um, Amanda Gunthel, really spearheaded that effort. We um, started putting together um, PPE packages to share with hospitals because down in the Fairfield County area, people were really running low and you had staff that was working in, in both locations. And so um, really because of the good work of Amanda, we facilitated the sharing throughout the state of PPE. You also had anesthesia machines that were actually loaned out to um, hospitals around the state to help in, in um, supporting that response. And, and I, I think it was um, effective and, and really helpful. So throughout that process, we maintained the, the channels of communication with the state um, really in an effort to help facilitate um, the response and then be involved when we, when we looked at resuming cases. Um, just to give you a quick um, summary, I know many of you guys are very well aware of the situation, but we um, have a travel advisory in Connecticut really focused on testing and quarantine, much like New York, New Jersey, and others. Um, and it was really done in conjunction with New York and New Jersey. You have to fill out a health form um, or pay a fine. You have to test negative or quarantine. And this is really integral to um, you know, the resumption of cases because you had to have some of that information available to you as, as um, you had 
folks traveling in from other parts of the country, frankly. This is what the map looks like today. It might change tomorrow afternoon, but basically the entire state, that entire country practically is under quarantine um, for Connecticut. Um, we have a lot of information available on the state website. This is just a snapshot also. Um, it may update soon um, of where we sort of stand today with COVID. Um, the, the red areas of the state are really where we're on red alert. Um, the, the state has recently, um, the state has recently, I see that little wrap up there, sorry, Greg. The state has recently um, sort of scaled back the, the reopening and, and has gone from phase three back to 2.1. I'll just give you a little bit of a quick summary. Um, we've sort of spearheaded the spearheaded the development of a working group with um, the hospital community to talk about ways that surgery centers and hospitals can work together as we prepare for that spike. So um, there's opportunities for care coordination, PPE and equipment needs, really looking at elective cases on a regional basis, because when they canceled, ele uh, halted elective cases in Connecticut, um, Eastern Connecticut didn't even see the um, effects of COVID until really this recent spike. So it's really changed things. And then testing capacity and delays is, is certainly an issue that I think many people are experiencing. Um, and at the end of the day, I just think it's really important that we have a strong unified voice. If this situation has showed us anything, it, it's showed us that it's really important for us to work together um, and to talk about the impact that COVID has had on the delivery of care in surgery centers from a scheduling perspective, a testing perspective, PPE, and all of those issues. And so I'd like to make a little, another little plug, you know, to support the, the PAC um, at the national level. And if you have a PAC at your state level as well, because it's really important that we have folks who understand the value proposition of ASCs. So get to know your state legislators, host a visit. We're talking about doing some virtual visits. We have some new legislators in Connecticut. So it's important for them to understand what we do um, and um, just get engaged and, and participate in the process. So that's it. All right. All right. Thank, thank you all very, okay. very much. We, we, we didn't leave ourselves as much time as we hoped for questions, but a couple of questions. And I appreciate this is a, a difficult format while we're all in our different locations trying to live on, on time schedules. So I apologize if I rushed any of you. Um, I know I probably rushed each of you. So um, we'll, we'll just go very quickly with the last three or four minutes that we have. It, it was very interesting to hear um, the differences. Each state, some states have mandates, some states don't have mandates, but very importantly, how each of you worked with, sounds like with hospitals, transferring machinery, um, making sure that there was care for, for the patients of your respective states. So for me, thank you very much to all of you for all the work that you did. Um, and I guess a que one of the first questions, I have a list of about 10, we'll get to one or two maybe. Um, once COVID's behind us, sooner rather than later, we all hope, and I know Jeff, you mentioned you're ready to move past it, we all are. How do you think ASCs in each of your states are going to be changed? Is it gonna be back to business as usual from beforehand or have things uh, irre irrevocably changed in your states. Uh, whoever go, go in reverse order from before, Lisa. Okay, so that, that's an interesting question. We've had that discussion here. You know, some days you have those barn burner days when you're moving patients through. Um, and, you know, obviously currently that you're really the scheduling piece and spacing patients out. Um, so I think people believe we're maybe not going to get back to that volume so quickly. Obviously, the, the good news about the um, vaccine that just came out, that makes us very hopeful and optimistic. Um, but I think that, um, you know, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. The question is, will we get back to that point? I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I think we're trying to look at, we're very nimble organizations. I think we're used to doing things, um, you know, and, and really providing high, co high quality cost effective care. So, we're going to stay focused on, on doing that and protecting patients while we do it. Great. Thanks, Jeff. In, in New Jersey, anything? Uh, I believe you can hear me. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, I, well, I, I think we've changed forever. Uh, I don't think it's ever going to be business as usual. Uh, a lot of the stuff Lisa said is true, though uh, business as usual, I don't know how you're going to define it. You're going to define it in the kind of in the number of cases you were doing before and the types of cases or in how you perform those cases. Uh, I think it's going to get back to 
the number of cases is going to come back to where it was, but how you treat your patients and how you perform those cases, that I believe has changed forever. Uh, health emergency or not, uh, I think we're doing things, we're going to be doing things completely differently. Right. John? Yeah, I, I, I echo what, what both my colleagues say. The other thing I wanted to know is that, uh, you know, we, we see that uh, the potential here to migrate uh, not just additional cases, but additional services potentially from the hospital setting to, to surgery centers. You know, there's, there's some discussion within uh, some of the health systems in the state uh, about, you know, things like, like birthing um, and, uh, the, you know, healthy, um, healthy maternity type services. Um, also, you know, the further migration of, of elective type of, you know, I, obviously I know the total joint and the spine thing, and that's been going on for a while, but we see this uh, to, to continue to, to move things in that direction as, you know, hospitals are, are obviously well suited with, with dealing with sick patients and, and responding to uh, pandemics and things like that, whereas surgery centers, you know, we, uh, we are very good at, uh, at doing surgery. Great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and squeeze one more question and I'll probably get yelled at by the next session, but uh, I have a list that I wanted to get through. Maybe we'll, we'll get to some uh, later on. Um, there are spikes going on, as Lisa, Lisa mentioned. Um, some states had mandates, some didn't. Quickly, in, in 30 seconds or less, um, I, everyone wants to get back to work. If the spikes continue to rise, does anyone, what, what do people see? Do you think there's going to be another shutdown or you think we're going to work through it at this point? Lisa, start with you. Um, oh, I, I will say, I think we've learned a lot from this first experience and maybe an across the board shutdown of an entire state. Um, you know, maybe that's not the best way to go, really looking at things on a, on a much more regional basis or, um, I mean, you looked at the, the town information that we have even a more localized basis. So the good news is we have testing, which at the very beginning we were lacking on. So I think we have a much better picture of, um, you know, where our patients are. I think we've also learned that delaying that care is really not in the best interest of anyone. So I think we have to look at doing this in a, a you know, a, a a well thought through, planned, coordinated fashion. So, great. And you, John, any different opinion? Yeah, no, I, I, I think the same thing. I, I think it's, you know, the response is, is, you know, even as the cases go up, we've seen uh, different areas in New York, you know, developed red zones and things like that. But we've been, we've been very, uh, you know, very happy to see that that they haven't, even in those areas with where it's spiking, uh, they have not made any any. Uh, have done anything about elective surgeries or anything like that. So uh, I, I think that's good. And, and I, I think that that's good news, um, you know, uh, make, makes us happy. Great. Jeff, anything to add to that in our last few well, seconds? I'm a cynical guy, but um, I don't believe that uh, you're going to see um, ASC electives shut down, at least not here. But um, the motto is always be prepared. I mean, we already have a plan in place uh, for uh governor's office, legislature, Department of Health, and everything like that with all kinds of talking points and facts and figures uh, to be ever ready to roll out should there be even a hint that uh, the state or the governor is considering that. Fantastic. Um, well, I wish I had more time for some more questions, but I really appreciate all of your time. Um, it was really helpful and, and informative information and keep up the good work with each of your states and hope to do this uh, next year for the eighth annual in person with the three of you. Thanks again.